after this, uh, she gets older and um, she has her first blood moon and she's sent to her private lodge and has a, a time of visioning and the elders instruct her on her next journey. And so she's exploring downriver in the direction where they told her to go and looking for things that she saw in her vision and digging roots and a storm comes and so she's hiding in a cave along the river. This is called Drowning Colt and the illustration is um, this one here where she rescues the colt in 1847. Shange jinga ushpe, horse little sinking. The floods came swelling the Ninshu day, washing out whole trees and cutting banks. It rained for days, relentlessly washing earth away, shifting the river, crowding it thick with mud. Stones rumbled and rocks piled high where the river pushed. Water willow was hunkered high up in a limestone cliff on the white cliff, sheltered from the storm. Looking down river, she thought of the rich brown soil the river would leave in its wake. Her eyes scanned below for foods and medicines, tender leaves and swollen tubers. She knew the banks would be brimming with wild foods in the moon. She imagined arrow leaf, nukthe, and camas, the ground rich with the crisp bulbs that brought them new strength. As she was dreaming, Ears up came around sudden with a wet nose in her face, licked her cheeks and tugged her sleeve whining. She stood to follow and leaving the shelter of the limestone cliff, she heard a high cry in the distance. The sound from far up river. The river roared below the cliff from which she watched. Above its steady push, she heard the squealing cry and turned to see an animal up river, slashing through the water, bleeding a boiling cry for its mother. Its slick, dark flanks bobbed closer to the ridge. Ears up zipped down the river's edge, and Water Willow leapt down the bank, running to shore as the animal was propelled towards her. Its front hooves flailed the current, and she realized it was a pony. She dove into the icy water, which pulled faster than she could swim. She held her head up and twisted round till she caught sight of the pony again, realized it was up to her to save them. She swam against towing waves of undercurrent to intercept the pony's path. Ears up watched, barking from the shore, running alongside the Russian river to keep up. He trailed behind as they cut out of sight. The sharp hooves hammered desperately at the river, lashing a hind hoof out, squarely kicking her thigh. Her cold, blue hands came within reach of its stubby tail, and she stretched to catch it, heaving its rump up with all her strength. But losing momentum, the pony's head slipped under, and when it came up again, she had her arms round its neck, her legs wrapped around its back, toes curved up under its slick belly. They swam hard to the river bend where they clawed six legs up onto a sandbar. Once there, her arms went limp. She lost her grip, slid off his neck, let him go. The pony scrambled, bucking up, lashing hooves in all directions and slipped through deep mud, struggled up the slip bank. Her body collapsed, a dizzy ringing filled her ears as she watched the pony trot away. Water Willow wrung the water from her moccasins and dress. She watched the horse, head lowered, coughing, grunting, its legs stretched out. She noticed how different this pony was than any she'd ever seen. Its legs seemed twice the length of its body. It wobbled as much as it trotted. Its head was much too large. Its cry was weak and scrawny. Its tail short and stubby, hanging like a weed, still dripping the river from it. She watched it go a ways and then followed. The pony slowed and dropped to its knees, rolled in the sand, back and forth from back to belly. It stood up, shivered all over like a cottonwood tree to shake itself off, and she watched it sneeze into the grass and wobble to one side and fall over. The pony lay there, tangled in itself, panting hard, she could count every one of its long ribs heaving so high up on its chest that at first she thought it deformed, malnourished. It turned to her, trembling, as she approached. 
She looked into liquid black eyes like the river at night, thick eyelashes beaded with water. He blinked, snorted at her, but he did not make another move. He just lay there, staring, breathing, with those funny, heaving ribs. Water Willow made herself small and moved in closer, squatting. She licked the palms of her hands and put them out to ride the current of air that flowed to the pony's nostrils, moving her wrists in a soft wave like a bird on the wing. The pony watched her intently, braced and ready to flee. She whispered soft, making soothing sounds with her tongue, breathed a song to the strange little pony, and kept on singing until he was familiar with her smell, her face, her scent, her voice. As he relaxed, exhausted, she slowly crept closer. When within reach, she lay down on the bank beside him, stroked his neck, and sang him to sleep. Water Willow tied knots in a hide strip to make a quick halter and hummed into his velvety ears and blew warm air at his soaked face. She wrapped her arm round his neck and scratched his jaw, deftly slipping the halter over his nose. This horse had been handled before. It seemed all familiar. But when she finally touched his muzzle and felt its new softness, she knew this horse was in fact just a baby. Colt, but a very large colt. Little big horse, she said, Shange Jinga, Tanga, you owe me your life. <laughs> big horse woman, ages 13 to 18, Shange Tanga Wau, horse big woman. <clears throat> The colt ran with other yearlings, bit their rumps and necks, bullied his way to claim the best grazing. The horses that her people rode and traded were sturdy, strong, and quick. He was chased off by older mares, colts, and stallions until he matured. He learned horse manners from the Ponca herd. As the little horse grew, she became, they became strong allies. Water Willow walked by his side for many seasons before she would ride him. Even as tall as he was, she could tell he was too young. He grew strong and carried her baskets and bundles, dragged her buffalo skin house on her large pole travois. She taught him manners at every chance, and his natural docility surprised everyone. <coughs> Even when he towered above the withers of the tallest stallions, his legs were still forming bone and lengthening out. He was awkward, and his rear flank sloped upward to a high, square rump. She waited for him to stop growing and balance out. Eventually, a superbly balanced body of immense and perfect proportion overcame his fledgling awkwardness. The people watched as the little horse grew beyond any they'd ever seen. One well-aimed hoof could crush a man's skull. They again concluded that this granddaughter was acquainted with great powers and had truly found her spirit's medicine. When he was no longer a colt, she called him Big Horse. The people now called her Big Horse Woman. Shange Thanga, Shange Thanga Wa'u. <laughs> <laughs>